Good. So like this is only like this is like sort of tangentially related to the actual movie. Um, so like uh, toilets are really, really funny to me. <laughs> okay. I don't know You're why. You're a big fan of toilet humor. But any time that I see an image of a toilet that is like in a state that a toilet is not supposed to be in, I just think that is the absolute funniest thing. Like I, you ever see that picture that floated around on the internet for a little while where it was like some guy like set a toilet on fire? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> That was just the absolute funniest shit to me. And like when I see a toilet that's like uh, like the ones that we see in this movie uh, that are like, you know, broken, like shattered in some point. I never think that like, you know, somebody took a, a hammer to it and cracked it apart the way that it probably actually happened. I usually just think like, oh, somebody just took a massive forceful like <laughs> shotgun blast of a shit and just destroyed that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't disagree with that. That is actually something that I've thought on multiple times as well. Right? Yeah. So then in the I'm... one scene in this movie where she like opens up the toilet and it's all full of bees. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler. That was just, <laughs> that was just um, so I'm funny to, to me. So my mom, when we were hanging out with her, um, mentioned this bathroom that they had been in recently that like she was with a bunch of her friends and they were like okay let's go to the bathroom before we uh before we we head out of here and they opened the door and it was just this really long corridor <laughs> with like a single light bulb and the bathroom at the very end of the corridor oh, yeah. <laughs> bathrooms it's a ghost in there for very sure. scary um none of them went into the bathroom and used it and yeah. i found I was like, yeah, no, uh, I wouldn't either. The fact that all of them looked at that bathroom and were like, something bad will happen to me if I go into that bathroom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's a reason that the ancient Romans believed that there were demons living in their toilets. That was probably Did they? That's That's where the word custodian comes from. There used to be a guy whose job it was to hang around in public bathrooms and fight the demons if they attacked somebody. <laughs> what a job that's so valuable honestly to society right. that I'm... i love that <laughs> why hasn't anybody i'm trying to that find right now i had a picture uh we got uh, an indian family that lives on the street and someone got married mm -hmm. so it was it was a huge party and like i'm talking like three four days whoa and at the end of it all that's invited? left of the party no. I was not invited. We almost um, ran over a kid, though. Like, we didn't actually almost run over a kid, but they were, there was They did run right into the street, and the photographer looked mad that I was driving down my own street. Well, yeah, but, how know. dare you? Um, but yeah, I, uh, oh my gosh, I can't find it. But after, after the wedding festivities were over, all that was left was this big, ah, here we are, <laughs> this big flower arch, uh, which disappeared pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But then the uh, the much more powerful image of a toilet, um, that which is powerful. It, it just made me think of, uh, especially <laughs> with what Jeff's talking about, where it's like looking at it, looking at it. All that happened to it is like the top of the tank, like the lid got broken. But like, it's still good. It's but I'm wondering what else happened image. to this toilet that they can't use it anymore. Yeah, that's because wild. in my mind. You just get a new lid. Yeah, I don't know if they sell put those, something but like else on top of there. I yeah, like, but they replaced the whole toilet. Here's so. my thing. My favorite thing is that this toilet appeared outside the house during the time in which the wedding was thrown, <laughs> which to me says one of the wedding guests blew up that toilet. <laughs> one of the wedding guests did something that resulted in that toilet breaking. They took an upper decker. <laughs> <laughs> Must have. <laughs> but yeah, that toilet, um, that toilet sat there for close to four weeks waiting oh. for the, uh, the trash guys to actually take it. It just lived there. They just didn't oh, wow. want to take it. Wow. They didn't. Yeah, I don't, I don't I think don't they did. Them. I feel like every time they drove past, they were, this is like, this is me projecting. Sure. Um, they drove past, they were like, oh crap, I forgot that we were supposed to bring the correct equipment to get this toilet. I'll remember next week. And then no one ever did leave notes for the other crews or anything so that someone would be able to get the freaking toilet. Do you need special yeah, equipment for it? No. I don't know. In like, my mind, they were like, this is heavy enough that they didn't pay for us to take it, so we're not touching it. How yeah, heavy is that's probably also a toilet usually? 
do you think? Pretty heavy. I feel like that. I mean, they're ceramic. I don't know much about toilets or porcelain. They're pretty heavy. Yeah, I mean, you've you've lifted a toilet lid before. I mean, you probably well, wouldn't have a they're like problem, 50, Jeff, 60 since pounds. you're a competitive weightlifter. That's true. Okay. I Jeff mean, there's no barbell like... attached to a toilet, so I know I'd be useless. <laughs> <laughs> you could drill a hole in it and put a barbell through. <laughs> oh, there we go. Perfect. Shit a hole in it and put I a can barbell through. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're now six minutes into toilet banter. I so knew I think this would get us off to recording. a good start. <laughs> I knew oh, that was sorry a good that you don't like toilet banter. <laughs> And welcome to Casual Obsession, the horror movie podcast where we talk about horror movies. I am one of your lovely hosts, Nina. I'm the we other lovely, lovely host, hosts. Emma. It's holy shit. <laughs> I claimed it. I'm the only other one. Oh. <laughs> okay. We have two lovely hosts. The other two, you guys can pick a label. I don't I don't care. I'm the quirky host. Oh my god. Noah. <laughs> oh shit, he already took the quirky <laughs> host. What am I gonna do? <laughs> You're the boring host. I'm the boring oh, host. You're the straight Jeff. man host. Oh. <laughs> Jeff is the host that likes paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Loser. Oh, what kind of person likes paying taxes? I oh, like you being done paying taxes. <laughs> I like well, paying Nina, taxes what? because of what the are fraud we that I commit about? every time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't say Anyway, uh, yeah, today we are talking about Candyman 1992. We're on the heels of a new Candyman coming out that I'm very excited about. Um, it comes out on the 27th. I don't know when this episode will be released, it'll um, be but it's released it'll be before, before then. then. <laughs> Just in time. Yeah, it it'll be the we're we'll be we'll be out before the movie. So yeah, I'll say the 21st. <laughs> the 21st. I don't know what. We're doing. Anyway. Uh yeah no Candyman 1992 I've been waiting for this movie to come out uh, the new movie to come out for a while uh but because of the apocalypse it got postponed um a, a few times because I remember when uh things first like shut down it was supposed to come out very soon and then they were like oh I guess it'll come out later this year and then it, they were like just kidding uh 2021 late 2021 and so here we are but. Finally, it's time, and it gave us time to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm excited uh, about? What are you excited about? This movie came out the same year I was born. That's and that wild. that means I don't consider it an old movie. Yay. Yeah. Finally, as we were right. watching it, as we were watching it, I did also realize that it doesn't feel as old as I remember it feeling. The pacing and... um. And the like shot composition is more modern than I do remember it being. I had mm, kind yeah. of lumped it in with the other slashers in my head as as being slow paced. But this is a pretty short movie. Yeah, all when you considered. warned Emma about, I'm sorry, Emma, it's another really old movie. I was just like, Candyman's not like a a slog. <laughs> no, in nah, fact, I don't even think bad. I got three pages of notes. I, I did not. I I. I Specifically, wrote a couple things that I really wanted to bring up. Um, Ooh, yeah. Well, I would love to hear about let's those. Let's hop to that. But I also get done with the. Uh... But I also like. I don't actually know anything about this movie. <laughs> so, That's like a Nina, lie. I was wondering. <laughs> I was wondering. If You're you a liar. A synopsis. Noah. Uh, you can't prove that. Oh shit, he's right. Okay. You can't Nina, it. you tell you tell me a spoiler-free synopsis. I'll tell you if I remember it. Okay, so Candyman is a movie that is based uh, a little more I uh, loosely, I think, than Hellraiser. Yes. Off another Clive Barker story, uh, The Forbidden. But uh this movie is called Candyman instead. Uh so that's that's a fun little change. Are you gonna sneeze? Just keep talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, Candyman follows a grad student uh, named Helen Lyle, who is studying urban legends. And this study and the recent death of uh, someone in their uh, Chicago, right? Yeah, it's Chicago, right? 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't remember. It's true. No, I swear to God. Uh, yeah, no. A recent death prompts her to look into this urban legend that she's heard about called Candyman. Uh, it leads her to a housing development, a low-income housing development called Caprini Green, um, where she investigates the death of someone there. And um, during that investigation, thinks it would be really freaking funny to do the thing that triggers this urban legend, which is to look into a mirror and say Candyman five times. Uh Nothing happens at the moment, of course, and she thinks it's super fun, uh, but then people start dying, <laughs> and that's about as non-spoilery as I'm going to get today. You remember any of that, Noah? No, not really. Can, can, I say, you told me that. can I say the thing that bothered me the most about this movie? Go for it. not a spoiler. Go for it. There was only one part with candy in it. Yeah. And, like, I know, like, the reference to the candy because of the trailer for the new movie, but that lore is never talked about in the old movie at all. Never even touched on nope. it. No candy, no. really. They just have, like, the candy like no in, candy like, the Candyman room. But then, yep. other than that, candy is not mentioned ever. No, So why the fuck is it called Candyman? Because that's his name. Why is his, his name actually is Daniel? Name Candyman. <laughs> I was wait, wait, wait. Hold on. When they is, said the lore is that he's from the old timey days. He doesn't. His name is not mentioned in the movie itself, but, oh, okay, uh, okay. but I think in sequels it is mentioned. That's his a, name is Daniel. A, a talking point that I'm going to bring up later on. So I was just like, oh shit, do they actually say his name? Because that brings my whole thing down. <laughs> no, okay. no, no, no. Okay, I just that's, think I that's all I had so. to say about that. We we can. <laughs> move on before no did you just say daniel larusso like from the fucking karate kid (laughs) no (laughs) i said his correct name and what was that noah (laughs) you know daniel (coughs) oh Oh, man the gouts get into his lungs (laughs) the gouts got to my lungs yo (laughs) um okay well so how was this movie received critically well well, um, once again, we're going to be looking at the uh, the adjusted numbers in some departments because, uh, as we all know, movies that were uh, released pre-internet yeah. have really weird ratings online. It's true, inflation um, and everything. It's true. Uh, the ratings are actually awfully similar to Hellraiser. I wish I would remember to keep them side by side, but I didn't. Um, IMDb has us at 6.6, Rotten Tomatoes at 76, Metacritic at 61, and letterboxed at 3.6 out of 5. And I don't really get why they're that low. I, I feel like they are actually really low. It's throwing me off. Um, that's like Rotten Tomatoes I'll accept. Beef. I'll like accept Rotten Tomatoes. But 66 feels really low to me. Yeah, that... Eh. Letterboxd makes sense. Rotten Tomatoes makes sense. You know, those, those are both hitting the 70s, but... IMDb is always really low. Mm-hmm. It's true. I feel like it's because less people use it, so. And the people that use it for horror are less likely to, uh, they're more likely to be picky, I feel like. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you could be picky about Candyman. <laughs> well, the A24 types. Because there's types no candy. <laughs> no, the A24 types. You got me there. Uh, okay, so there, next. Also, there's no candy. I mean, Emma. Emma's right. I'm calling no it candy. now. Emma gave this a one star because there's not enough candy. Dude. And and she's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh so do we do It's right there. So, Triggers, yeah. Um no, nope. we haven't we talked oh, about our know. ratings. What do you think about it? Why do uh, you guys always get it wrong? That we don't it's the right. order of <laughs> I even clarified Can you guys my do note from one episode time? that I don't host where you get the order correct without me no, reminding you. No. We absolutely one cannot. Day, whenever we cover Saw, Emma won't be here and this part's going to take twice as long because we're going to have to keep jumping back like, oh shit, I forgot to do the critical reception. <laughs> okay, so do we recommend it or not? Uh, I'm, I'm going to start because I picked it. You can't start, you go last. Jeff has Aww. to start. What? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff has to start. Because, I mean, I can't go next because I'm talking too much. Jeff, just go ahead. And Jeff, I am <laughs> And it would be transphobic to make me go first. Oh, well, that That's makes true. sense. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I agree, but please. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give it like, um, 
I want to give it like an 8.5, I think. Yeah. I really like this movie. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Is that 0. 0.5 uh, short of a 9 just because you uh, there's no candy? Oh, my God. It is. There is candy in this movie. It's just not featured heavily. It isn't entirely unrelated to the lack of candy, but there are other factors. It's the lack of eye candy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, I don't get it. So there's, I'll, I'll there's do mine tits next. In this movie. I'll do mine next. I okay. give this movie a nine out of ten. Oh wow, nine out of ten, Whoa. Noah. Nine star Noah. Nine star Noah's back. We got what three we weeks in a row? Again. Nine star Noah. Two weeks at the very least. I don't know. I, don't know. I like was, this movie a lot. What was our I think third moves, last movie? Yeah, what did, what did we do before that? <laughs> it's been so long. But yeah, I I really like this movie. Um, I love how Wolf fast Cop. it is. I what like did you how give Wolf Cop? Oh, definitely not a nine. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a ten. Probably give that like a seven. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and before that was Creep. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um... I love how fast this movie goes. I love how clean and concise the story is. I love how it has its heavy handed story points without feeling like it's ramming it at you. It's like you still, you know how some heavy handed stories are like, and then you can't have any fun. This one, I feel like there's heavy handed moments and you don't leave it feeling like the movie's talking down to you. You still feel like you're having a good time with it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It manages to strike a good balance there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to give it Emma? I'm going to give it 6.6 .6 should have had more candy. Mm. Fair oh. enough. Can't even argue with that. <laughs> Just like IMDb. Just like IMDb. Would you like to round that up to a 6.66? 6 .6? I'm Just yes. for cool points. With, with a line <laughs> over it. Mm. Repeating, oh, of course. Repeating, of course. infinite sixes. Repeating, yeah, we all um, went to math school. <laughs> yeah, back I mean, when I, I was in math school, they I taught enjoyed us it. math. There are a few things I didn't like about it that we'll get into with the mm -hmm. spoilery parts. Um, I think it does show its age a little. I'm excited mm. to see like the mm -hmm. new one to see how it's improved. Um, but yeah, it is weird. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's all good. Nina. Yeah, this what, movie what is, give it? this movie is my favorite, uh, I think Flat my favorite, favorite horror movie. Um, it's a nine out of 10 for me. I'm open to there being better movies than this, but it's going to be hard to come by in my opinion, because this movie has a lot going on and it has everything that I like in horror. It has something that it's trying to say that it uses horror to do intelligently. It's not just like, Oh, a horror movie that also has a political message crammed in or anything. Um, it's it, the, the horror is there to, accent and to for a purpose with with what it is trying to say mm -hmm. um and it's also got all of the like really gothic stuff i love the the soundtrack is incredible the um the story has a lot of like okay i'm not gonna sugarcoat it candy man is really hot as a character he is um, pretty hot honestly <laughs> his voice is really his good voice is incredible it's like and two pieces his, of marble just grinding together. Right? Mm -hmm. And his lines and his manner of speaking are just so poetic and romantic. And, like, it's everything I like about reading old, like, old horror, like, books in a villain. And I really, really love him as a character. And I love, like, that he is not just... Oh, scary horror villain. It's there's a lot going on with him and I really like that. But yeah, no. Hear that y'all Nina's leaving me for 1992 Tony Todd. I will. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for you he doesn't exist. No, anymore. come on now. Are you trying to tell me that you wouldn't leave Nina for 1992 Tony Todd? Come on now. I mean, I'd be tempted, but you know, I made a promise. <laughs> 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 to my wife. 
That's right. I remember that one time. You left me for 1992, Tony Todd. Damn, I kind of wish I'd put that Everyone in Everyone at the wedding was confused, but I knew <laughs> what it was. That was a weird thing to point out specifically until I thought about it. And then I was like, well, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. You were like, well, it's 1992, Tony Todd. It is. All right. But yeah, that's all. That's like my reasons for loving this movie. I don't think it's perfect. Um, I think part of why I love it so much is because there is a new one coming out. Well, what did you rate it again? Nine. Okay. Um, no, I didn't give it a perfect score. Uh, I, no, I wasn't <laughs> anticipating that you did. I um, just couldn't remember you actually yeah. saying a number. <laughs> I would, I'm really looking forward to the new one. And part of like why I love this movie so much is that I love what it like could be in a way as well hmm. i do love what it is and i think that it stands alone really well but i think the character like so many like great concepts um i think that the character could be so many things and the story could be told so many ways and i'm really excited to see it told in a different and also i think from what i've seen probably better probably a better way and so i'm really excited about that mm -hmm. uh but yeah before we keep going, I think it's fun to talk about triggers. Uh, I think that's fun. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I don't think that's fun at all. Kind of weird. So of you. they're kind of fucked up. There's a few. Kind of fucked here. up, though, you, Nina. Um, I think it's fun because I like keeping people safe, and this is a way of doing it. Oh, oh so you go. think safety uh, is fun? I do. <laughs> yeah, okay. I am a nerd like that. Okay, <laughs> so um. <laughs> There's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot going on here. I, there is, sh shockingly, though, this is a very, um, what was I going to say? This movie talks, talks a lot about gentrification and, um, segregation by gentrification and, and by, like, class divide, um, and, and by, like, race because of that class divide in a lot of ways. Um, and, but it never is actually specifically said there's not a lot of specific racism here it's just a lot of um that kind of 90s polite right racism of just talking about gangs and unsafe areas instead of being outright racist but that is something to be aware of going in um there is noah's triggered assault and gang violence here um mm -hmm. uh and then i think uh i know in the past now I am sure in the past that I've said uh, that like if if you don't love people being mental mental like institutionalized for mental issues and not being believed um, that can if that's stressful to you that happens in this movie and then uh, like so many freaking movies this movie includes the R slur um, I will mention that it is used in the like way that it was technically used in the past to refer the quote unquote appropriate way yeah, yeah it is it is actually referring to um someone who has a mental disability but it does happen uh and is rough so there's that that's i think about everything unless anyone else uh, can think bees. of something i missed there's oh there's so many bees flashing lights as well oh there oh, are thank so you. Many there are a lot of flashing lights so uh, um yeah which i had you, completely Joe. forgotten about until watching it yesterday yeah, uh, flashing lights and lots of bugs. If you are uncomfy with bugs, dang, dude, there sure are bugs. This one is very um, intensive with the bugs. <laughs> very intensive with the bugs. Not, honestly, not as uncomfortable with the bugs. And this is this is kind of talking about, uh, like, when Jeff and I talked about gothic horror. This movie's bug stuff doesn't feel as uncomfy as Phenomena's bug stuff. And I think mm. that's due in great part to how the bees... And the honey and all of that are kind of part of Candyman's character. And Candyman is such a romantic, stylized character. Yeah, it ends up um, feeling more poetic than gross. Exactly. Also the fact so, that it's just that bees still... and not all like flies and beetles and shit like in Phenomena. And maggots. Like, it was and just bleh. very gross in <laughs> Phenomena. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a much more, um, still a lot of bugs, but much less highlighting how gross bugs are yeah uh yeah but i think i think that is it at that point then cool yeah cool nice okie dokie emma you know what time it is uh about 4 50 <laughs> oh nice thanks <laughs> you know 4 50 reminds me uh how scary did you think this movie was weak that's a reach <laughs> <laughs> about 4.5 out of 10 i'd say 
Um, <laughs> no, this Rounding is kinda, up, of course. I mean, if you're scared of bugs, I think this will be a scary movie to you. But this isn't so scary a movie in that it's like really, really creepy. It's more. I don't, I don't know. It wasn't a very like super scary movie, but it's like a really cool concept. And um, I think if you, like Nina gave the trigger warning about um, being like institutionalized um, and uh, like if you're afraid of that sort of thing or if you have problems with that sort of thing um, and kind of like questioning your own sanity, I think that will increase the scariness of this movie. But um, I I didn't I didn't think it was too scary, so um, probably like a ten out of ten. Yeah, that, seems that makes sense. Yeah, this yeah. is this is definitely one of those movies that like it's a horror movie because of like the gore mm-hmm. and not because it's trying to be scary. You know, yeah, yeah it's like, more interesting than scary. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so speaking of interesting I'd like to tell you why it's interesting by giving you an entire rundown of the whole plot maybe uh, I'll finally remind Noah of what happens in this movie <laughs> I, I'm very grateful for this uh, so again can't we start with a, kind of a shot over the city of Chicago with some really dramatic uh, music this follows pretty much throughout the whole movie um, we I have love some the very in this movie. <laughs> yes, the little piano. Doo, 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 doo. It it's has a very v- good. It's, Candyman's theme is very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it just kind like of Candyman, it, right? <laughs> 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 um, but it kind of, it sets it sets the tone in an interesting way because you don't think of like urban Chicago as being like the setting for a romantic gothic story. So the the contrast of the like organ and piano um and the cityscape is really it really sets the tone um and then we open uh do we open with the um this is actually something i always forget because in my head we open with the story that the teenagers tell um but i'm not sure if that's no we open with the tony todd monologue yeah, it gets right, to that right yes. after the, his, the tony todd monologue. his like big clive barker conversation oh. about flesh i have read yeah. clips from the forbidden um, that kind of describes some of the interactions that do happen in the movie between Helen and Candyman, and I need to read Clive Barker, Barker's actually work, actual work, because it's so good. Um, but yeah, it it starts out with um, Candyman's big monologue about um, flesh and what is blood, if not for shedding, and all that stuff. Love that um, line. And uh, and that's that's where we start out is kind of with this ominous ominous introduction of Candyman, which is great because we don't see him for another like 30 minutes after that <laughs> um but then we cut to uh some some conversations that helen is having with um some students they're telling a story about a babysitter uh it's kind of very similar to like some creepy pastas you might have heard of honestly it's it's very much that like teen spreading stories kind of thing where um this babysitter has the bad boy over she's she was babysitting this kid and she thought it would be a great time to bone the bad boy so she invites him over he drives a motorcycle he drives a motorcycle she's dating someone else but he drives a motorcycle so um she invites him into the bathroom and because she wants to be cool in front of this bad boy she tells him the story of Candyman and you know, challenges like you do with him. your dates when they come over you bring him into the right, bathroom right exactly <laughs> and you make out in front of the mirror i guess <laughs> and then you try to Wait. summon a ghost you try to summon a ghost and they try to summon Candyman, which uh we learn in this scene is by saying his name five times so uh the the boyfriend the bad boy sorry says the name four times and then leaves the room and the babysitter's like i'm gonna say it a fifth time i ain't no chicken so she says it again oh wait no they all say it together don't they my bad mm-hmm. They say it all together. And then she turns off the lights right before she leaves the room and boom, Candyman's there and blood comes through the ceiling and it's very dramatic. And the students are like, yeah, um, the girl was dead and so was the baby and Candyman did it. And Helen Lyle is listening to this story with her friend Bernadette and they're like, well, that's super interesting. 
good to know. We'll take notes on it for our thesis. And they uh, head to a classroom where Helen's husband, um, Trevor, is teaching a lecture. Um, we hear from this lecture that it's very similar to the themes that uh, we've already kind of been getting into with urban legends and spooky stories. He's talking about um, kind of how important urban legends are to society. And as he finishes, Helen Lyle comes up to the front and she's like, hey, dude, um, firstly, why was that student flirting with you just now? That was really weird. And Trevor's response to this is to be like, yeah, I'm totally cheating with my student. Like, I would ever do that. Uh, spoiler, he he, 100% is cheating with his student. He just thinks it's it's really a great way to gaslight his wife to just say it and then act like she's being ridiculous for thinking that. Which it worked. So It did work. The pro Helen, tip, everyone, gaslight your spouse. Don't gaslight your spouse. <laughs> Don't be like Trevor. Don't gaslight your spouse. And then the second thing Helen is pissed about is that Trevor is giving a um, a talk that is basically her thesis. It feels really disrespectful to her to basically pull the rug out from under her and give this talk while she's working on her paper. And he's like, um, how am I supposed to teach them if you're putting boundaries on what I'm allowed to teach? Which is like, uh, they're not going to suffer. Their education isn't going to suffer if you just if you don't talk about spooky stories, Trevor. Um it's it's he frustrated. Well, the best part, the worst part so is that like odd. she wasn't even asking him not to give that lecture at all, but just to hold off until they had published their For thesis. One more semester, right? She was like, being really reasonable, <laughs> and he had apparently already agreed not to do it, and then he just goes yeah. and does it anyway, like an asshole. Yeah, Trevor's, Trevor's the, the worst. Terrible, He's terrible so example awful. Of like, uh... <laughs> Helen's not perfect, but Trevor, like she deserves better than Trevor. Um, so she's like, okay, I guess, see you at home. And she, uh, she goes to kind of get more information uh, and write down her notes that she took from, from the interview that we saw. In the interview, the students mentioned another woman had died in a similar way, whose name was like Ruthie Jean. Um, and she's listening back to her notes and a janitor comes into the classroom to clean it. And it's like, oh, you're talking about Ruthie Jean. I, I know about that. I have a friend who was friends with her. Let me let me bring her in. And Helen gets more information on Ruthie Jean's death taking place in Caprini Green, a housing development that is uh, kind of a, a lower income kind of place. And Helen's like, yeah, this sounds like a great thing for me to go and check out on my own with uh, with my friend Bernadette. Bernadette, super uncomfortable with this, uh, this whole idea. Um, but goes along with it anyway. They're... Bernadette is a saint who has Poor no Bernadette. patience for Helen. <laughs> Bernadette uh, and <laughs> Helen start to head over to kind of check out this whole thing. Um, Helen has mentioned that the layout of those apartments are nearly exactly the same as the layout to the apartment that she lives in, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and she points out that uh, the bathroom mirror has a hole behind it. Uh, they, they didn't they didn't like put it together in such a way that was very sturdy. So if you open up the medicine cabinet, there's a way to punch it out and like crawl into the next apartment. Um, so they plan on doing that when they go to Caprini green, they get in the car, they're headed over. Uh, Bernadette points out that they are dressed. Um, I think that Helen's idea and Helen is super naive and has a lot of really um, dumb ideas, as you'll see. Um, she's, she's trying hard, but she is uh, the story makes it very clear she is kind of the pinnacle of like a white savior mentality. Um, she thinks that she's doing her best. Um, so she's beyond reproach, kind of. Um, she gets in the car and she's like, I told you to dress conservatively. And Bernadette's like, yeah, but now I feel like I look like a cop. Uh, Helen's idea was kind of to dress in a way that like wouldn't get them super cat called, I think. And instead they end up, yeah, they end up looking like cops. So they pull up to Caprini Green <laughs> they pull up to Caprini Green and after some interactions with some of the residents, they get up to the, the apartment where Ruthie Jean died and um, Helen finds the bathroom, pops through the through the bathroom mirror and it's like, hey, Bernadette, come with. And Bernadette's like, absolutely not. Uh, and Reasonably. hangs back. 
reasonably, and Helen takes her uh, her camera in. And I feel like it is important to note she has already said candy. Man oh, that's when that happens. Point. I didn't remember if it was before. She, or she did it at her apartment before going to Caprini Greens. Okay, I didn't remember which bathroom it was in. Yes, uh, Helen before they went to Caprini Green thought it would be super fun to try and summon Candyman. So she and Bernadette in Helen's bathroom while explaining the apartment layout. Uh, say Candyman five times. Actually, Helen does. Bernadette chickens out on the last one and doesn't say it. Uh, it's important to mention um, that Bernadette is a black woman, and um, it's definitely her, even though she is very wary of Caprini Green and um, definitely displays the fact that she has been like raised differently than... than uh, then she definitely displays the ways that she's like been grown up differently than Helen and that she still respects this myth in a way that Helen does not. Um, and Helen's like, ah, you chickened out. Anyway, <laughs> they then in, in Caprini Green, Bernadette stays behind. So Bernadette's a lot more cautious than Helen. Helen gets to through the, the bathroom and looks around. There's some candy with razors in it. And she crawls through a hole in the wall. And this is one of my favorite shots in the movie. As she's crawling through this hole in the wall, we see that the hole on the other side uh, looks like the mouth, the open mouth of Candyman. And she is like crawling out of his mouth um, into this room. She's looking through for evidence. Uh, did she find anything back there? Just, Just the candy, candy wrappers? Candies with razor is in them. And that's the only time we see candy in the movie. Clap, we did it's it. It's got no Woo. bearing on anything whatsoever. It's no bearing on anything. There's just candy. And it's never explained. There's also uh, in Caprini Green a uh, graffiti on the wall that says sweets to the sweet. Um, and yeah, that's another little nod to candy there as well. But we don't really get much more of that. Uh, Helen returns to Bernadette and they are confronted by one of the residents whose name is Anne-Marie. Uh, Emery lets them into her apartment to talk about stuff, um, and we meet uh, Emery's baby Anthony at the same time, and her big Rottweiler, who is not super happy about the strangers being there. But Emery opens up to them when she sees that they like are not cops and are also not there to you know make a problem for anyone. She opens up to them about Ruthie Jean and what happened, and also about Candyman. And Helen's like, okay, great, more information. I will be coming back at some point. Um, okay, so then uh, Helen thinks it's a great idea to come back alone, and she meets this kid named Jake, and Jake tells her a new story about Candyman where a uh, child went, uh, ran off from his mom and uh, had uh, in the bathroom had his... It's unfortunate. Uh, his genitals cut off in the bathroom, and it's really, really, really gross. Um, Helen thinks, again, it would be a great idea to go into this bathroom and investigate. And while in there, she gets um, confronted by uh, a group of men who are um, the leader is dressed like Candyman. He's wearing a long trench coat and has a hook. And he basically says, I heard you were looking for Candyman. Well, now you found him and he knocks her over the head and knocks her out. Um, she then later identifies him in a lineup and the um, and she is uh, outraged openly that no one uh, attempted to find this man who they think is Ruthie Jean's killer until um, a white woman, as she like she says this herself, until a white woman was attacked. No one really paid attention or tried anything. Um after this, uh, she is walking through the parking lot and things get way more interesting because this is the first time we meet Candyman. Candyman is like, hey, uh, he shows up in the parking lot uh, and says, hey, I heard you were uh, looking into me and you do not seem to believe that I exist. So I thought I'd make it pretty clear that I do. Um, also... Sup? <laughs> yeah, because he because she makes a point of telling Jake Candyman's not real, and then Candyman shows up and he's like, "Excuse me, excuse me, you sure about that?" <laughs> I heard what you said. <laughs> I really she love the way he seems... says it, though. The way he's like, "Your lack right. of belief shook my congregation." 
So I was obliged to come. Yeah. Or obliged, sorry. Obliged. <laughs> obliged. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Anyway, obliged to come. I'm blodging. Please stop. Anyway. That's that song from Gravity Falls. I remember that. Eat yeah. your own pants. Eat your, eat your own pants. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, he, he um, kind of invites her to be his victim he does he does and she seems kind of entranced by this and then she wakes up in a pool of blood in Anne Marie's apartment um there is a cleaver next to her and she has no idea whose blood it is or what happened she picks up the cleaver thinking i'm guessing that she's possibly in danger because she's starting to hear screams throughout the apartment and she goes to see Anne Marie screaming and wailing over the crib of Anthony that is empty and also coated in blood. Um, absolutely enraged and saddened, Anne Marie turns and and tries to confront Helen, who she thinks is the murderer. And Helen, in defense, um, <laughs> stabs uh, like lodges the cleaver in Anne Marie's arms just as the cops arrive, which makes Aunt, uh, Helen look like she is in fact the murderer. Um, Helen is <laughs> Helen is taken covered in blood to the police station. She searched. She tries to call her husband, uh, who does not pick up the phone. Uh, good for him. When he picks her up, he's like, "I was fast asleep. I didn't even know." Uh, Trevor. Anyway, uh, she is able to go home for a while, but she is being investigated and it's kind of a big deal. As she's trying to recover from this, um, Candyman keeps popping up around uh, in her bathroom. And when Bernadette comes to visit her later on, Candyman also kills Bernadette. Um, and frames Helen again. This time, Helen is institutionalized, and at the institution, um, Candyman starts to kind of outline his plan. He says, look, if you live with me in, like, if I if you let me kill you and live with me as, like, this myth for, like, the rest of eternity, it'll be really great, I promise. Um, I will let the baby Anthony live. He's alive. I will, I will make sure that he is, like, let go and safe. Um, and Helen's like, great, that sounds 100% dope. Uh, no, it doesn't. And she, <laughs> so she resists a little longer. She tries to speak to a doctor, but Candyman also kills the doctor, which is kind of Helen's fault because she did say his name five times in front of him. Um, she straight, yeah, she straight up summoned she, Candyman. She straight moment. up summoned Candyman on this guy. Uh, she escapes the mental institution. She runs, uh, to where she knows she has seen visions of Anthony, um, and finds that Anthony, uh, she finds Candyman's art, right? At that point? Yeah. She finds this art of Candyman. I, hold on. I totally forgot the part where Candyman's myths are explained. I am having was, a bad it day. It's just okay. a shitty dinner party. Okay. Uh, but yeah, these the, uh, the paintings basically are of Candyman's origin story, which is that he was the son of a slave, um, and, but his father was able to kind of after the Civil War, create this life for himself making shoes. And Candyman was brought up really well educated. And because of that, he was able to kind of form this career as an artist. And one of the women he painted was this white woman that he fell in love with and got pregnant. And this was obviously not cool with the girl's dad, unfortunately. And so... Well, I mean, her dad had hired him to capture her virginal beauty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because of this, uh, her dad had Candyman, um, lynched, like, and we are told the story of this in detail. Um, he had his hand cut off and a hook jammed into it, and then they covered him in honey and let the bees that they had stolen the honey from sting him to death, um, and then burned his body. So Candyman shows up as she is looking at this mural and again tries to kind of prompt her and tell her how great it will be to live in infamy and never have to like do anything but to just continuously exist. And he describes it as this really like wondrous existence and she's still not super convinced and tries to stab him and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, he he opens up his mouth and there's a lot of bees and he kisses her open mouth with the bee mouth. And that's a really fun scene. 
Um, she does pass out and he carries her to the a bonfire that has been set up by the people of Caprini Green. And no. no? No, he just leaves her there. Oh. She goes down there herself because she sees him. Oh. Or she hears like the baby. Yeah. You want to take the end here? Yeah. Sorry, All right. I'm having a hard so time. after after Candyman gives her the big smooch and she gets knocked out, he grabs the baby and decides, I'm not going to follow our deal. Takes the baby down to the big bonfire and is going to let the baby burn. Uh, luckily, Helen wakes up, hears the baby, goes into the bonfire. However, on her way down, she happened to also grab a uh, a meat hook. So Jake, who happens to wake up and look out the window, is just like, I see a hook going into that bonfire. And he's like, candy man. So uh, he gets just everyone who lives in the apartment building apparently comes out. And they go to burn down that big pile of trash. And, you know, Candyman bear hugs Helen in the pile. And he's like, haha, tricked you. Now you're here. You got to stay with me forever. Uh, but she uh, shakes him off, gets the baby out. But she does die from her burns. But the yep. baby is returned to Anne Marie. So, you know, everything is cool and groovy. Up until the end, where uh, we didn't mention this, but, you know, as we all know, Trevor's been uh, sleeping around with his students. Uh, she does walk in on him, so Trevor shows up to her funeral with his mistress, which is tacky as hell. That yeah, that's um, that is a classic. I would advise you don't do one. that. <laughs> Best to avoid the situation like, by not having a mistress to begin with. I would say he like smooched her at the funeral. At the funeral, and as he's like making out with his new mistress, all the residents of Caprini Green show up um, to Helen's funeral in a procession and drop Candyman's hook that they found in the remnants of the bonfire into uh, the grave with her casket, yeah. um, as kind of an exam, a uh, like symbol of them recognizing that she basically beat Candyman and, spe- and has become a myth in- and of her own right. Uh, so but we cut. She becomes Candyman, 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 Candyman. Yes, because we cut to Trevor living his best life with his mistress, but he is plagued by the memories of his wife who he cheated on and didn't believe when she told him what was happening. And she made such a good and... food for me without <laughs> even asking. <laughs> that was the memory. That that, that was, was my favorite yeah. part. Is how. <laughs> Was, his mistress she's just like she's a hey kid so. would you like to let's make some food together and he's just like oh My back when I had Helen, she just made me food so he cries out in front of the mirror basically mourning her he says her name five times and helen shows up behind him with candy man's hook and her hair all burnt off and she uh kills him with the hook and the mistress is left to find him and that's uh, the end of the movie. There we go. That's the movie. Shitty end. I hated it. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you next time. No, I'm sorry that took I so long, everyone. I really hated that ending. I thought it was, it was really a, it, the ending to me. The ending to me is the roughest because I think it's um. Uh, it kind of makes it I feel think... like the movie misses its own point, right? Right mm-hmm. there it is. Thank you. Absolutely, it kind like, of does. I'm just like, for one, what spurs him to be like, ooh, I'm going to turn off the lights and um, say her name five times and see what happens. Like, um, Emma, I could... he was, oh, Helen, Helen, oh, yeah, Helen. Because that's what you say when you're sad. Boy. <laughs> he was sad. Well, I miss my he was wife. Being That's a why sad I boy. Her. He was being a sad boy and doing that while he was on the toilet, but then he like turned off the lights and did the Helen, 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 Helen. It Helen does make more sense to just keep being a sad like, boy on the toilet. It's a if, better move. If he had, it would be better for her to kill him on the toilet too. Yeah, <laughs> if it was if it was that and maybe there was like a mirror across from the toilet or something, and it was like mm. an accidental conjuring. Like that, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. Or if he had gone to the mirror and said Candyman five times um, to see of like a thing of like, maybe she wasn't crazy and maybe this did actually happen. And then she showed up and killed him. Like, I'm okay with that. But for him to go to the mirror and be like, 
oh, I'm going to try to summon her by saying her name five times. I just think that's stupid. Yeah, I agree. I think it's stupid that she turns into this kind of like a Bloody Mary kind of figure. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's not as impactful or cool as as we'll get into with like kind of what Candyman means as an urban legend and what he symbolizes. (sighs) Helen does not have any of that same symbolism no. In any way, um, she's just like she's not just she was a victim, but mm-hmm. she is naive and she isn't she wasn't victimized in the same way that Candyman no, was in not his nearly death. on the same level. Yeah. Um. So I. I have. So when you were doing the recap, um, I didn't realize that the kid's name was Jake. Um. So I have a quick conspiracy theory. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh. So the baby in the movie's name is Anthony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in the new movie coming out in a couple weeks, um, the main character's name is Anthony. So, oh, yeah. oh, that makes sense. So oh. like, yeah, I think it's like, supposed to be the same dude. Yeah. That's so what that's I heard. like the older, it's like the adult. I'm excited. Version of Anthony, which is really cool, but that kid's name was Jake. And as we may know, the new Jake from State Farm. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm, oh I'm my just gosh. saying. Emily, what you're if blowing this Jake wide open. Is Jake from State Farm? Oh my god! Whoa. Um. Also, I know you you talked about it at the beginning, but um, the girl that gets killed at the beginning of the movie. Uh, and you explained that she was trying to like impress her like cool boyfriend that looks like just kind of like vanilla pudding in a leather jacket. Um, and he also looks like he's like forty. Yeah, but he looks like the kind of guy who would hang out with her. Not yeah. like also she like is a groupie, but like he's preying on young women. Yeah, yeah. But just what is up with her Candyman fetish? I think she was right. trying to have a ghost threesome. Maybe, but Agreed. he starts. He starts. You want to say that loud man. enough for me to hear? You know, a greasome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's just kind of like <laughs> he. He comes to the house. She's like, "Ooh, come up to the bathroom or whatever." And he like comes up to the bathroom, and she's standing in front of the mirror, has her shirt off, and she's like, "Ooh, have you heard of Candyman?" He's like, "No." It's like. Say his mirror five times and he'll appear and kill you. And every time he says Candyman, it's like she's just getting more and more erotic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just awkward. I'm like, it's so he's, awkward. he's not even looking in the mirror. Let's be real here. Him yeah. seeing the mirror is an accident at best. Yeah. I don't think his should count. No, absolutely not. But I just I don't get her Candyman fetish. No. Um, or Helen. Also, as I mentioned earlier, because in this movie, like the only reason I understand the razor blade and the candy thing is because of like the trailer for the new movie, right? And in the old movie, it's, it's explained of Candyman was like the son of um, the educated son of this guy who got rich from an invention in the late 1800s and then became like a really renowned artist and then was killed for getting the getting a white person's daughter pregnant um and was fed to like bees and all this stuff but like it's just the the candy with the razor blades makes zero sense in the context of like the original movie not at all Mm -hmm. and it's like frustrating and I, I make the joke of, like, why the fuck is he called Candyman? But, like, seriously, why the fuck is he called Candyman? Right. Like, it makes no uh-huh. sense with the lore of the movie. So, um, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think that the um the only explanation I can think of for the candy with the razor blades within the movie is that even though he doesn't have any candy associated with him, his name is Candyman. Um, so people would... But uh, why is his name Candyman? Yeah, I, you c- I couldn't tell you. 
Yeah. I think it's I think it's cool though. I don't know, because honey is sweet like candy and honey man sounds less scary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess it. Yeah, I guess that's not very scary. Also, um, the bee man, <laughs> the bee boy. Um. Also, shout out to um. Kind of, I don't know if this this story was partially based on this murder murder, but the murder of Ruthie May McCoy. If you guys have heard of that. Um, is that the one yeah. where uh, a guy was able to like climb in through the the mirror and stuff? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. So she, um, this kind of came up again um, recently, maybe like six months ago or so. But when uh, on TikTok, this girl in her, I think it was like New York apartment. Oh, that yeah, I saw behind that behind her mirror. There was like a whole other apartment um, that was completely abandoned and it was really freaky. And she like posted about it and then she posted about like her exploring it and all this other stuff. And that kind of brought about this story of like, yeah, um, this is something that kind of happens in like some of these older apartment buildings. And it actually led to this woman's murder where um, she was kind of like a very paranoid woman um but like all of her neighbors knew her very well and it was kind of in this it was in chicago and it's in this very kind of gentrified or like not gentrified but the um but due to the process of gentrification a lot of the black community was kind of forced into these apartments and um she called the police one day and was like hey these people are like breaking through the walls into my bathroom and they're mm -hmm. trying to like come into my bathroom. And the cops were like, what's going on? And she kept trying to tell them and they weren't really taking her seriously. And so um, eventually they send some cops out there that get there like 30 minutes later. And um, after a neighbor said that there were gunshots. Um, they finally go there and then they're investigating and they're knocking at the door and nobody's answering, obviously. Um, and so they're like, well, guess we can't go in. And so they leave. And then like the neighbors are like, hey, you guys really need to check this out. And so the cops come the next day and they're like, well, we can't really break the door down because then if she's in there and she's mad that we broke down her door then she can sue us so we're not going to do anything and they leave again and then it's not until like two days later that the security office finally comes and like opens the door and yeah she was like dead with four gunshot wounds and I think it's found that she bled out it wasn't that she was killed instantly oh, so the cops had actually like gone in there like right away they probably could have saved her and it's just this whole fucked up thing and it's very it's very very similar to the murder that's referenced in Candyman. Um, oh yeah it absolutely so, is based off of that there's no way it's not so, yeah yeah, yeah. So, i mean what they they use the same name even mm -hmm, very close yeah mm -hmm. what what was the name that you said emma that. is ruthie what um her name that's ruthie may her name was Ruthie Mae McCoy. Okay, and in the movie, the the person who's killed by the guy climbing through the mirror is Ruthie Jean. But then, uh, Anne Marie, who has the baby and the dog, her last name is McCoy. Mm. So they put the whole name Interesting. in there. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. Also, I'm mad that um, the so the white woman gets possessed ish and starts killing people and the only people that die are the black people in the movie mm -hmm. yep until the end when she kills her husband but like it's frustrating that like the one black friend gets killed yeah <laughs> just kind of 
the whole like old horror trope of like, oh, all the black people are going to die. I think that this is intentional, though, because I think it speaks to part of the metaphor of who is hurt by these stories, despite mm. the people, the people who get involved in it. Like, Helen's the one who wants to get involved. None of the other people wanted to get involved, but Helen survives the longest because of her privilege and because she is not actually affected by the thing she's starting. I think mm -hmm. it's actually very intentional. That's my personal opinion, though. Yeah. That makes sense. It's cool. Yeah. Um, I like that read. Which leads nicely into uh, that particular part. So we're going to get heavy here first. And then later on, I want to talk about the the more um, style elements of the movie. But I think it's important to talk about the messaging and metaphor of this movie first. Um, I read a lot of articles leading up to this because this movie, uh, again, has a lot to say about um, and in a, in a very 90s way, a lot to say about gentrification and about stereotypes and about racism. Um, and one of the things that is very important to note is that Candyman became Candyman through no fault of his own. He was doing normal people stuff and was targeted because of his race. Um, and because of that, people kind of created this version of a victim who was a scary killer um, and made the people who killed him um, like out to be less less terrifying you know mm -hmm. so he is in a lot of ways kind of this this representation of um stereotypes and how they grow and how they loom over communities and how um how hurtful and harmful they can be and i read one thing that said that helen's pairing as the like kind of reincarnation of his lover um, kind of shows how these stereotypes are often paired with other stereotypes of like the white woman victim um, who is often p held up against the stereotypes of black people in, a, in order to kind of create this victim um, so that they ha can be justified in their hatred. Um, so it's, it's a very like kind of complex um, metaphor, but it's really it's really interesting. Um, paired with kind of this like folklore element that's a lot more forward in the movie of um, the unkillability of of legend and folklore. So yeah, yeah. I um, do love. I mean, I I'm just a sucker for folklore stories. I think they're really interesting, um, and I really love kind of like. The idea of this movie exploring kind of like a folklore that very much feels real. Um, I thought it was really good. Yeah. I like, mm. I, um, I like I, it a lot, too. I thought there were going to be a lot more bees. There are in the in the sequels. Wait, there are sequels? They're, three, they're not good. Or it's a total of three movies. They are oh, not good. I thought it was I thought it was just this one and then the new one coming out. That's kind of what everyone acts like because the other okay. two are just so bad they're not even worth watching. Yeah, they like um, missed the point even harder than this one did, right? Right. Yes. It, it just turns him into a slasher. He, he got is... uh farewell to the flesh and day of the dead. Candyman Ugh. is a slasher villain, but um Jeff and I were talking is about he... this. He's he is yeah. He's not in Dead by Daylight, so how can you be so not yet? Oh, not shit, yet. Not. not yet. Him if he and could... Pinhead are coming soon. They have been rumored to be coming do soon. In Dead by Daylight. Hang on, no man be horny. What does he do? <laughs> Pinhead is maybe thought that it might be him or some character from Quiet the Night at Freddy's. There's no candy I'm, I'm going to cry if it's Freddy's. Candyman, it would wow. make sense because the new movie is coming out. Um, but yeah, he, he is a slasher villain. He fits most of it, but he's also he's very different from most other slasher villains. Um, I think the one he would most similar be most similar to, in my personal opinion, is Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they both sense. talk. They both have a very iconic hand weapon. Um, well, and also they're... 
their both of them their their reason for being as a ghost is that they were uh killed by a mob one way or another and they live mm-hmm. on through the the haunting of the the collective consciousness of the public mm-hmm. exactly yeah but Candyman's, i think is done a lot more elegantly and purposefully a lot more compelling. Uh, it doesn't f- and a lot more compelling yeah um absolutely one of my big things about Candyman as a character is that his iconography doesn't feel as like kind of mishmash as some of the others. Cause like with Michael and Jason, their choice of disguise or their choice of like headwear is feels very arbitrary because mm-hmm. Jason's mask isn't even picked up till the third movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just kind of steals it from one of the people he kills. He's like, Oh, that looks cool. I'll put them on face. And yeah, I don't like my face. I like this mask better. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And then Freddy Krueger, I don't even know. He made the knife hand, but there's no reason why. Um, um, he's a pervert. Yeah, he is a pervert. He but is that a pervert. Doesn't... Um, can't, all of Candyman's iconography directly has to do with why he died. And it feels like he is taking the the horrible things that were done to him and weaponizing them. And it's really it is compelling and it is a lot more interesting than just, and I thought that this character design looked cool, even though Candyman's character design is incredible. Uh, he has a very recognizable silhouette and a lot of really cool like moments. He opens up his chest in one scene to reveal that the entirety of his rib cage is exposed. Um, and Clive Barker describes it really terrifyingly when he when he writes about it it's he describes like the flesh hanging off of it and stuff and it's like clive are you okay um but he wears this he's not (laughs) 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 the bees in his mouth are also really really cool imagery um tony todd uh you can tell very much in that scene that um helen might not be a real person a lot of the time in that scene. It doesn't look. It. I'm not sure. If it's uh, her Virginia or not, Madsen but... is very allergic to bees. Yeah. So. Yes. So it's very clear it's why. not actually. Her. I couldn't remember which one of them was very allergic it's to not bees, Tony, but I remember that trivia. He got stung so many times. Tony said he would hold the bees in his mouth, which he did. That was really him doing Badass. live bees in his mouth. He um, had but, like a thing in his contract where he got paid more every time. He every time stung, he got right? stung, yeah, and he got yeah. stung like twelve times or something. Twenty something, I think. Ugh. It was it was not a good time Jeez. for for him. Have you but, have, have any of you guys ever been stung like in the face or the vicinity of the mouth? I got stung no. above my eyebrow, and it was like literally I was I just thought I was gonna die for a second. Mm-hmm. I got stung <laughs> on the lip once. And then later found out, uh, not to my surprise at all, that the lip is like one of the three most painful places that you can get stung by a bee. Ooh, Holy yeah. cow. It was people so are telling bad. you this and you're like, yeah, I kind of figured that like, out. Like, yeah, no Thanks. shit, dude. <laughs> like, I got stung like eight <laughs> other times in that same incident. They got like inside my clothes and stuff. It was awful. Oh, oh no. Was that one like uh, mowing and stuff? Because I feel yeah, like it was I one of the times that but... I was, yeah, I was mowing the lawn and I rolled right over a gigantic like ground wasp nest. Yeah. Oh, and God. they just came right up and got into my clothes. It was very, I remember very bad. Being made fun of for running away from these swarming bees. I wouldn't have made fun you of you. That? I was doing the same no, thing. No, you didn't because we were both running away together. Yeah. <laughs> And I... that happened to me twice. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't believe I kept mowing the lawn after that and thinking back on it. Like, what in the world? I should have gone on strike. I've only ever been stung in the calf. Oh, nice. That sucks. That's... Did you step on something? No. No. I think no, I was just was walking stung. by. Mm. Um, I was like walking on the sidewalk and there were a bunch of bees flying around this tree. Uh, and yikes. Think, uh, one just one of them the just. She wasn't happy about it. I can't believe that bee was transphobic. I wasn't gonna say so that. <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, it, it 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 wasn't too bad. I mean, it hurt, but it wasn't the worst thing. I don't even know if what stung me was a bee or if it was a particularly angry bowfly. Because I was diving under the water and um, something was like on my face when I dove, and I think it panicked because it was gonna drown and it stung me. Oh, so. <laughs> Well, that uh, seems like it would have been very easy to avoid for him, but all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, depends. like, yeah. before starting this movie, like, 
with my I didn't have much understanding of Candyman. I knew it would be a lot about gentrification and race. And um, I knew Candyman has like a lot of bees. And so like the bees don't really come in until like the end. Um, and the other times you see Candyman, there are no bees. And so I was like surprised by that. But I also didn't know like a lot of Candyman isn't him going around killing people or him chasing after Helen to kill her. It's her kind of getting like possessed or hallucinated to kill other people um, via Candyman. And I didn't know that was a thing. And so uh, I was actually kind of surprised by that in this movie. Mm. Yeah. No, that's another thing that makes this movie stand out against like other kind of similar formulated movies. Um, this movie, um, I'm not gonna do any any spoilers, I don't think, but this um, this movie reminded me a lot of the New Invisible Man with Elizabeth Moss, um, with similar themes of like, is she crazy or is it really happening? Um, mm -hmm. And like, The Invisible Man is like a way more like obvious character to do that with but um it's still i i really liked it in this in this movie because it like it it opens it up to a completely different kind of fear and a completely different kind of storytelling that is i think a lot more interesting to me personally than having a guy running around and killing people it it makes it a lot more emotional because you know that like helen is not doing this um as yeah. at, like consciously um yeah and also the fact that the killer the reason the killer is killing people it's not for like revenge it's not because they're crazy it's because even though one could argue that at this point candy man as a as an entity he's not a person anymore he's just this entity is not is not like the normal human version of sane but um his reasoning for killing people is that he has this kind of like romanticized idea of existence and what it means for him to exist. And he enjoys existing and he enjoys being held in terror in other people's minds. And that makes him a really interesting and compelling, like kind of villain for this kind of movie, you know? He's not just, a, oh, I'm going to kill you. He's like, hmm, people think I'm going to kill them. And I, I I, I really like that because they are also kind of right. Where do um, you get that kind of personification from? Because I don't really see that in the movie. Uh, it's mostly just from his, like, the way that he describes to Helen what it's like to live on after death and to live on in this, um, in this existence of just existing. And the way that he describes pain and killing is exquisite. You know, he kind of revels in a lot of it. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. But that's like a lot of this movie with like the soundtrack and the um, the way that Tony Todd's voice kind of like drones on and the way that like hit the focus on the horrific elements of him and the iconic elements of him and the bees and the hook. Um Again, it's not all that gross. It doesn't ever really focus on a lot of the gore of the people who die. Bernadette's is a lot of really quick flashes. Um, and other than that, apart from a lot of, like, uninvolved blood uh, until Trevor dies, we don't really see a lot of gore apart from Candyman himself. So I think that's really interesting as well. So this movie, unlike Hellraiser, is not like focusing on the gore and on the like horrific elements it's focusing when Candyman is there it's focusing more on what he's saying than on like any killing or gore that he has involved with him so, yeah i don't know i just think he's a really interesting horror villain yeah most definitely um that makes sense i get it yeah I really like him. Uh, I really like a lot of, of this movie. I do not like Trevor as a character. Trevor, uh, he, he sucks. really sucks. Yeah. Trevor's awful. 
Clive I'm Barker glad he's does there. not write a good husband. No. Also, his new girlfriend painting literally everything in the apartment pink um, was <laughs> bold. Very. Yeah, what's going on with that? that? <laughs> She's just in here by herself painting, and he's in his, like, super plush bathrobe, and he's like, oh, what's up, kitten? What do you need? <laughs> oh, you want <laughs> my help cooking? Fuck you. <laughs> It's I'm like the, just, the bad ending of Legally Blonde. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god, you're actually, you're absolutely right. Um, but if Trevor <laughs> didn't exist, here's the thing about Trevor. If he didn't exist, I don't think I'd have hardly any sympathy for Helen, is the thing. Because Helen does a, a lot of this. And like, I think that there's a very weak point to be made. I don't think the movie is trying to make this point. Um, that Helen is a a victim as well um in like a way that she's victimized by like society as a as a woman um and i've thought about this and the more that i think about this i think there are elements of that there but i don't think that it's intentional and i don't think it's something that like should be drawn in parallel to like anything that Candyman or went through um even though they kind of try to draw that parallel by having her be the entity at the end of things yeah um Kind of undercutting but without, its own point. Right. Uh, because she has not gone through anything close to what Candyman went through. Um, that That is like my least favorite part of this movie is that um, even though Helen as a protagonist does kind of strengthen some of the messages of the movie, she also undercuts them. Um, but mostly I just don't like her because without Trevor um, and the way that he gaslights and mistreats her, she is a really naive person and she's extremely frustrating to watch because um not only is she, she's not the um the like oh don't go down that d cor corridor don't split up don't do this yelling at the screen kind of horror protagonist she's just the oh you would do that wouldn't you kind of horror protagonist yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you really don't get what's going on here do you um so i'm interested to see in the new one um the story that's told without a Helen and without someone who is a total outsider to the story. Um, I was talking about this before we recorded um, from the trailers that we have seen so far for the new Candyman. It definitely feels like it's going to be focusing on the story from inside the community that the story comes from, which is I'm, I really, really, cannot wait to see that because the biggest flaw with this movie is that it's told from an outsider's perspective and it keeps its message from i think having the full impact or mm -hmm. at the very least from having the impact i think it wants to have so i'm really excited to see if the new one um i have a lot of hope because it's it definitely looks really really good and like it's going to be like that and i'm really excited <laughs> i mean the trailers have been incredible Especially oh, like yeah. the little shadow little, puppet. I was gonna one. say little paper so puppets. Good. Oh my gosh, that one was so freaking good. Uh, I love. It was supposed to, to come that. out on our wedding weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I love <sighs> seeing the artist. Like I love seeing artistic like stuff, like animation and and non traditional like animation in film more um at the beginning of birds of prey they have a sequence that is all 2d animated and even though 2d animation has largely gone out of style for like disney and stuff being able to see like experimental animation and art in um any mainstream film absolutely thrills me anytime and 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 here it is with like one of my favorite like movie characters too. So I'm just like, I'm super yeah. giddy about it. <laughs> I love kind of like being surprised by those sorts of sequences and stuff yeah. where um, the beginning of Resident Evil Village has a very stylized kind of storytelling kind of scene um, that like when I started the game, I was like, oh fuck, I didn't know this was here, but this is super <laughs> cool and I love it. It's a very um, cool opening scene. It is, yeah. It reminded me at the time a bit of like the um, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows mm, like, thing me too. where they're kind of telling the story of the Deathly Hallows. Um, 
And I always thought that was a really cool sequence too. Mm-hmm. Although, uh, fuck Turks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 100%. I think in, um, in this also, case, the... In addition to fuck turfs in general, fuck J.K. Rowling specifically in for specifics, other reasons. Yes, also. absolutely. <laughs> um, but I think I think to continue with the theme of like Candyman being more of a stylized and and like folklorish and beautiful story than like a a kind of like campy um like cheesy like story, which it could mm. be when you say a bee a bee man with a hook uh it's yeah. not though the, the <laughs> that's why they call the him use, candy man <laughs> right the use of the of the animation can lends the same kind of tone um that the the music it's kind of like the oh i i wouldn't have thought we were going to use this kind of music slash animation for this specific story but then when you think about the tone that's t- trying to communicate it makes a lot of sense I love it. You just sit there listening yeah. and it's like, oh, we're being classy today. <laughs> it's a classy villain. He is a classy villain. He has the best looking, best best dressed slasher villain. I know, Freddie, I'm sorry, your sweater's great, um, but that trench coat can't be beat. True. <laughs> I gotta be honest, if you, if someone's gonna argue with you that Freddie is a one of the best dressed slashers... <laughs> We got other problems here. Who, who do you think is the out. best dressed slasher? <laughs> the best dressed slasher? Yeah. Mm, let's see. I think we have our obvious answer. I mean, Pyramid uh, Head. Pinhead, Pyramid Head. Pinhead's not a slasher, so I okay, resent sorry. that you said that. Um, Pyramid Head is You need to be dressed hot, to be but best he's dressed. Not... <laughs> <laughs> I like the shirtlessness. Um, I have no idea who the K-pop killer from Dead by Daylight is, but he is in contention because he's got that bright yellow like K-pop like outfit going on. He's like a original, I think. To Dead what by about, Daylight. Um, it's a great concept. What about yeah, I like it. Patrick Bateman? Patrick oh, Bateman is an incredibly American. well psycho. He's, he's, he's sharp. kind of he a is slasher sharp. villain. Every and girl's he is crazy dressed. about a sharp dressed no man. No one ever said the slasher villain couldn't also be the protagonist of the film. I don't know that I would call him the protagonist. I would call him the focus character. Uh, that's, I mean, what protagonist that's is. what a protagonist is. Protagonists protagonist feel like inherently mean, positive. Though. No, it isn't. No. Protagonist I said is they just... feel. I didn't oh. say that it was. Okay. It's fair. No, yeah. That's, I guess that's fair. He's the killer. But that's though. why you say the hero and the villain. And if you are talking about good and bad and protagonist and antagonist, if you're just talking about like, I mean, like, Willem Dafoe isn't a hero on. in American Psycho, though. There just isn't really one. That's true. Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe is my hero <laughs> in real life. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We're you just didn't watch right? Spider Man. Just gonna ignore that one. <laughs> <laughs> the best dressed slasher villain is Jigsaw. You ever see him on that little bicycle riding that's, around? That's not B- Jigsaw. That's Billy. <laughs> the puppet's name is Billy. God damn it! Yes, <laughs> isn't that oh, stupid? That. I've never that's seen so Saw. Dumb. How am I supposed to know that? By watching, I don't know Saw. how much Billy's in Saw. In the first one, he's in there a little. How much he is? Yeah. yeah, it's the first movie he was introduced. He's not in Spiral at all, though. No. Yeah, Neither is yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> um, do we want to go to Noah's room? Alrighty. It's I, I feel like uh, Jeff has some things about uh, yeah, Jeff had his gentrification. I had a couple of things stuff, that I wanted I to talk about. I've been, talk about. Uh, I've been trying not to talk over people too much, though, and failing, but... Well, no, uh, really. your, go ahead. Noah, do you, now, have, do you have thoughts that you want to get to before we get to mine? particular talking points you wanted to bring up themes you know no because i feel i uh when you mentioned that you wanted to talk about the gentrification angle that unlocked a lot of ideas and i would rather jump off of your conversation and interrupt you rather than uh insert my opinion into nina's point Mm, okay which I i didn't have um a solid one so like all right so there are some pretty i actually disagree (laughs) <laughs> you don't think that the gentrification <laughs> themes are over? I think gentrification is cool, actually. It gives me bubble tea. 
That is exactly what Helen says in this movie. <laughs> she she talks when she's like showing Bernadette around her apartment. She talks about how the the building was originally constructed as uh, like a project, and then mm -hmm. uh, the area. She describes how the area got gentrified, and like a freeway got built to divide the city to put a wall between the nice places and the not so nice places. And she's describing this whole gentrification process as though it's a good thing. She definitely doesn't bring it up in a bad way. Yeah, she's Bernadette almost... Bernadette does try to point it out a little bit, but it doesn't bit. go well. But she's like, she's almost bragging about it. Like, that stuck mm -hmm. out to me really hard uh, watching it this time. It d I didn't catch that the first time, but then... It hit me really hard this time, and I couldn't stop seeing it through everything for the entire rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the whole time. She's just talking about how... And and her lack of understanding for areas that are not for her also mm -hmm. like, seeds into that, in my mind. Yes. She has no respect for other people's boundaries. She thinks not that she, since she has good intentions, that she's fine. She thinks that yeah. intentions are all that matter. Well, she's she thinks like it's okay for her to just keep going back to Caprini Green and going through this abandoned apartment just to take pictures, just because she's Every single person there is like, hey, can you not be here? Yeah. Emery, who lives right next door to the murder apartment, is like, why are you in my murdered neighbor's house? And she acts As like... <laughs> Like Anne Marie has some kind of an obligation to help her or talk to her and stuff because she keeps showing up and just knocking on her door, and Jake's mm -hmm. like, "Oh, she's not there." And it's it's like it never occurred to Helen that Anne Marie actually has a job that she has to be at and stuff like that. Yeah. You know. But um, that's something. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Sorry. Go ahead. No. If you if you've got something, you go ahead. Oh, no, no, I no, no. All I had to say is that like um, that's something that is like a theme that I think when people talk about like white privilege and people are like, oh, I'm not really privileged or anything, and I'm white. It's like it's more like you the, don't notice. <laughs> you don't notice. Helen thinks that she understands that she has white privilege because she voices it at one point when she's pulled the person out of a lineup. So she thinks she knows and has recognized that she has white privilege, but she also uses it with total disregard to the people who don't have that same privilege. And yeah. it's really interesting to see. Oh, and this is just to take us down a little sidetrack. I can come back to the gentrification thing. Like Helen never realizes at any point in this story how good she has it. When she gets arrested for the murder of that dog and the kidnapping and possible murder of that baby and she's all covered in blood... As she's getting checked into the police station, she's talking about, like, wanting to take a shower while they're checking her for weapons. And, she, like, all I could think through that entire scene is the only reason you're still alive right now is the fact that you are a blonde white girl. Like, if they had walked in on anybody mm -hmm. else standing over another person covered in blood, cleaver in hand, they would have just shot. They had their hand on the trigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is no reason for her in that situation to still be alive other than the fact that she's white. And she does not realize that that saved her. Mm -hmm. There are uh -huh. a lot of times that I wrote down um, when because she obviously has no memory of what she did um, or what Candyman did while she was knocked out, depending on how you decide to read the movie. Right. You know? um, she has no knowledge of that, but people are very they very clearly tell her what she did. Like, uh -huh. it's like, yeah, um, you murdered her dog. Where is her baby? And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about, but like it, she should remember when people are treating her poorly that as far as everyone knows, she murdered a dog and a baby. Yeah. And then when she kills Bernadette and she's treated very poorly there, She's like, no, I didn't do anything. But it's also she needs to remember as far as everyone knows, because uh -huh. this is this isn't like a. With the exception of the supernatural influence, there is no reason for anyone to assume that anything other than she just keeps killing people is happening. Right. And it was very frustrating to me. The. Um, oh, what's the word? Like she's got no perspective for it. She keeps thinking that everyone's going to assume her innocent despite Ignorance. the evidence stacked against her. I'm thinking like obtuse. I don't know. There's yeah. just a, there's a lot that she does that frustrates me because she's 
ignorant to her, like the situation she's walking into. She feels intentionally ignorant to her own situation. Mm -hmm. There's so much happening. She right. was drugged up for a full month and had no concept of the passage of time. Horrible. So like, and then the doctor's just like, well, I mean, you've been, it's been a month since you murdered your friend. And she's like, uh, what now? And he's like, so I'm trying to figure out uh, whether you're capable to stand trial. I did think it was so really like, funny in that scene, though, the way she was, she kept being like, can I talk to my lawyer, though? And the doctor's continuously just like, well, I, I work for your lawyer. I am doing this for him. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am a doctor. You can't talk to your lawyer because your lawyer doesn't know if you're fit to talk to him. It's, <laughs> we're taking steps at the moment. Right. <laughs> but I, yeah. But like, that in my mind felt like the natural conclusion to her just like you know just walking right up into caprini greens and being like well these people are going to harass us while we wait for the elevator let's just head up the back staircase and be as conspicuous as possible right oh let me just let me just harass the cleaning people who are in here and I'm ask sure them they questions won't mind. <laughs> and it's all consistent for her character. To the no, very everything end. she does is so consistent, right down to not understanding as she leaves Anne Marie's bathroom covered in blood and picks up the cleaver next to Anne Marie's dead dog. Like, hey, walking what's this into up? the room, Anne Marie <laughs> is crying in, and she's just like, "Hey, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on?" And Anne Marie attacks her, and she's like, "What are you doing this for?" It's like, yeah, like look at the it's situation like she doesn't here, doesn't have ears both physically and to the situation mm -hmm. she is in yeah. there's, there's a lot to her character to like what nina said if trevor wasn't there i would have very little sympathy yeah for helen over the course of this movie because every situation is caused by her inserting herself into a leave well enough alone situation not like really but like to a point that's like but she isn't yeah and the other thing is she isn't doing anything to help people she acts like she has good intentions no, but all but she's she doing is writing her thesis all she's doing she's mm -hmm. there for completely selfish reasons yeah um and she acts like because she's not there to hurt people that means they have an obligation to help her even though she's not doing anything for them yeah she's just there as a personal curiosity that's she's it. just there because she's Trevor investigating a murder group. She is investigating a literal murder as a personal curiosity because it'll look she, good in her thesis. And I'm so glad <laughs> Bernadette was there saying, hey, you do know that this is weird, right? <laughs> because she's like, oh, well, you know, you remember Candyman the other day. As it turns out, there's another guy who did the thing, apparently, and he's right here in town. Well, as let's opposed go to check the him very out. clear urban legend uh, vibe of Biker McGee and his girlfriend, there was an actual murder. And so Bernadette's like, this is this isn't stories. This is real, though. This is the news. My like friend lives here type of thing. Yeah, Which this I is, for all nicely. we know, a, a serial killer that you're going after here. Aren't you worried mm -hmm. a little bit? Like, <laughs> I think that leads nicely back into the, the, the gentrification like, angle, though. With it does, how, actually. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. if you want to continue with that, with all the um, Yeah, the so it's itself. like... Um, let me... Get my notes here so I can. Ooh, kind of oh, oh no! Jeff's I'm notes. actually reading my notes today. You, oh, I always shit. have it on the desk next to me, but I don't always look at it. Um, let's see. She lives in a gentrified area, and she's happy about it, bragging about it. Trevor sucks. Uh, <laughs> checking out the killings, uh, just as a personal curiosity, not to like try and get justice or something. Uh. Mm -hmm. Oh, when she's, like, getting ready to climb through the mirror into that adjacent apartment, and Bernadette says, what if there's somebody, like, packing drugs in there? What are you going to do? Are you just going to apologize and give them your card? I but then love when that Anne Marie walks so in on them with her scary dog, Helen literally she just literally apologizes just gives and gives her a card. Yeah! <laughs> Oh my gosh! That I thought was, that was a really that, funny I, thing to do, but it's also just like, well, yeah, Helen is that dumb. That's just <laughs> mm -hmm. Bernadette knows Helen very well, and I, I do yeah. like 
their dynamic a lot because it does make it like Bernadette, if she had stayed alive longer, is the like smart one and the hero of this film I, for a minute. Their dynamic is so good because like I love how you can like you can really tell that Bernadette is trying to make Helen get it. Mm -hmm. But she knows how monumental a task that is, so she has to do it slowly. She's yeah, just, it's, it's she's a really good she presence cares. in the story. She likes her as a friend. Yes. And is slowly making sure that she understands, hey, so... That stuff is bad. You know, when you say uh. the N-word around me, it makes me feel bad because <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize. I thought we were friends. No, that that's like the vibe that some of their friendship does seem to have. I really. feel like Helen it, wouldn't say that, though. I feel like no, I no, don't no, think she would, would make a big like, deal about the fact that she doesn't say it. But and <laughs> Bernadette, that's what Bernadette would have to get involved in. She'd have to be like, hey... Uh, it's great that you don't say the N word, but it's also really weird when you bring up that you don't say the right. N word and they'd have to have that conversation yeah. because like, I know people a lot like Helen names will not be named here, uh, <laughs> who, um, like you try and explain things to them and they have their own excuses and their own justifications for yeah. why what they're doing is okay because they think they're a good person. Right. And like the, and I am guilty. I like, I want to stress because this is a like conversation that we're having and this is like, um, something that we, any of us can be guilty of. Like, I know I'm not exempt from like, being that person sometimes who like doesn't realize what they're saying is hurtful to a group of people or to someone who is close to me. And like in that situation, when someone confronts you about that, the, the response should hopefully be to internalize and reflect on that in your own time and to apologize in the moment. And even if in that moment you think to yourself, well, I didn't mean it that way. Just like <laughs> say that say that you're sorry and then take your own time. Don't don't continue to put it on your friend to explain to you why you're wrong. Take take some time and like reflect on yourself and reflect on on why your friend might have said that to you. So, you know, it's it's it is it is a whole thing. There are real people out there like Helen, and that's why Helen is such an interesting and compelling character that you can understand, is because like this is something that is really frustrating to deal with in real life. And it, and you feel for everything that happens in this movie because you could see it happening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little peek behind the curtain here. Nina uh, had said that there would be no strong female uh, corner this week. <laughs> yeah. Strong female character. There it is. I, I, I'm like, oh, the whole thing fell apart on me. Um but I do want to point out that I do believe that Helen is another example of obviously this is a rewritten by um, the writers of the movie, um, not just Clive. But I do feel like this is another decent example of Clive Barker writing like a a good woman lead. Oh, yeah. Because not because I love everything Helen does, but because she is a fully fleshed out and good character. Yeah. You yes. Yes. She is a very well-written, well-realized character that every action that she makes makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And I think every character in this movie is like that. That's one thing that I that I really enjoy about this movie is like, again, every every character makes sense for where they came from in life and what their experiences have been. Um, even like I, I didn't mention this character because uh, I totally forgot the scene happened, but there's a dinner scene with uh, Trevor and Helen and one of their scholar friends where she mentions ben Candyman. Ben yes, Fra Ben Franklin. I said that too. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Purcell, but he looks like Ben Franklin. Yes. He, um, upon hearing about Candyman, uh, dis d dispenses Candyman's entire backstory. That's his role in the story. But he is someone who has written papers about Candyman before. And it's really interesting to me that S Helen gets the backstory of Candyman not from the people who, like, 
actually believe in Candyman, yeah. but from another person in her situation who studied it as a curiosity. I think that's really interesting as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Brings us back to the gentrification point. Thank Again. you. Again, <laughs> we're, we're, we're really good at circling <laughs> I have got back. to get this wrapped up so we can talk about other stuff more pointedly. Um, so the fact that Candyman's origin story uh, uh-huh. is... Ah, uh, that was my phone just buzzed. That's going to pick up on the microphone. Whoa. So, I can't believe it. Unsalvageable. Horrible. Okay, so... Buzz, buzz, more like ruined podcast. Anyway, let's <laughs> just... Since the, the folklore of the, the Candyman uh, urban legend is not based just in urban legend, but it's based in a an actual historical event. It's just the account of a lynching. And the... Where was I going with that sentence? God damn it. Um, so like it, it since it started as a historical account of a lynching, but then by the time we we hear about it the first time at the start of the movie, it's devolved just into like a, a Bloody Mary game for white kids to do when they have their 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 bad biker boyfriend come over or not boyfriend, whatever. Um, that feels to me like it feeds into the gentrification aspect because it's kind of like the 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 story itself is the 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 legend itself is becoming co-opted by these like well-off white kids that have nothing to do with the history of it and have no like uh I don't know care for it I guess just turn him mm-hmm. into another Freddy Krueger character yeah yeah and, and I think, uh I want to yeah, talk no, more about sure. comparing him to Freddy Krueger in a couple of minutes actually but um oh. Uh, that's a whole thing um but uh but then by the end of the movie i think uh i i feel like the ending with like you know them throwing the the candy man hook down into her grave and then her appearing to kill her husband at the end is kind of also signifying the gentrification aspect because it's kind of like she's taking over the the haunting of the public consciousness from him it feels like it's completing the cycle that we saw start at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like America <laughs> won't even let a black person be a ghost <laughs> without messing it up for Which them. Which is <laughs> ironic when you when you think of how this movie is often held up, and I think right, rightfully so. I'm not going to say it's not, especially with um, how unique Candyman is as a character. This movie right. is held up as like a real milestone in representation in, in horror media. So I mean, this was which, a black horror that wasn't out here like, look, it's Tales from the Hood. Yeah. <laughs> Although I have heard yeah. Tales from the Hood, the first one is actually really good. No, I've heard, I've seen the kill counts for it from uh, Dead Meat. Uh, shout good. out to Dead Meat again. No, no, no very yes, good. Very she good. said oh, no okay. for no reason at all. Oh, oh no, oh, okay, I meant okay. I meant it is very good. <laughs> Sorry, that was a no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind oh, okay, of okay. No. <laughs> Candyman is the first like black slasher killer though, which is it's kind of a big deal. Is he the only one? I don't know. I can't off the top of my head, I can't that, think of I'm anyone. I'm pretty certain that he's the first. Certainly, definitely the he's most definitely the first mainstream as well when it comes to that. Um, I don't know that I've seen if we're talking franchise, right? I've definitely not seen another. Yeah. And if we're talking one offs, I don't think I have. I think he's the only like black slasher icon. Yeah, I I cannot think of another, but Candyman also absolutely solidified Tony Todd as an icon within the horror community because he um, he pops up in a right thank goodness he's right. in hellfest as a carnival barker and it's fantastic he's in he's in uh, final destination as a all the final destination a, desti- as a lot of the final destination movies yeah, yeah as definitely not death in final destination <laughs> working yes. in the absolute weirdest <laughs> morgue you have ever seen <laughs> He's in um, Hatchet uh, in the first one because they were planting him as a more focused role in the second one was what my coworker and I have discussed, but I actually haven't seen those movies. Oh. Um, but they asked him to be in the first one because if he wasn't in the first one, his more focused role in the next one would not make sense, um, uh. was the vibe that I got from that conversation. Hmm. That's um, interesting. Yeah, it's kind of like a hair. I have a big plan. Let's actually set it up, <laughs> which you don't. I don't. I don't think you see that enough in horror movies. Usually, sequels <laughs> just feel like a, and we can get more money out of this kind of thing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no. This movie was 
important in a lot of ways outside of whether or not it told its story perfectly. It it does. Um, and we are getting another one because of it. And I think on the yeah. subject of uh, didn't tell the story perfectly, I think that um, what Emma brought up earlier is a lot of... Because um, Nina and I were talking, trying to figure out what exactly... as as people who the story does not speak directly to, just people right. who really enjoyed the movie. Um, well, what do you mean? This isn't the best representation. We were thinking about it and we couldn't think of anything like super, super specific off the top of our fair. Uh, it's not like it, it doesn't make any big foibles um, within its representation that like um, scream like this is problematic. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, like the way that so many old eighties movies and, and right. such do. Mm hmm. But it's still not perfect. And I think that discussing it and thinking on it has definitely made that clearer to me. This is a direct example of like what I was talking about earlier about like me still falling into this trap of, well, it's not for me. So I don't really understand why I have to think this way about it. But I'd like because this is my favorite movie. But because it is my favorite movie, um, I want to understand it more. And I'm really glad um, that I am getting to. I'm really glad that we get to talk about it here. Yeah. Especially before the Heck new one yeah. comes out. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, Noah's notes. Still I was say, Jeff, you wanna, Do you want to fire off real quick about Freddy Krueger and then we hit okay. the notes? Freddy Krueger. Um, I was really interested in that point. Just one real quick parallel that will feed into the Freddy Krueger thing here. Um, when Helen is arrested and such for killing that dog, stealing that baby, and they just let her out on bail, uh, the news report doesn't publish her name. Yeah. does not it does not as wow. a an interesting parallel to that when benjamin franklin purcell tells the Candyman story he doesn't mention Candyman's actual name or anything really about his actual identity at all Candyman is identified only by what was done to him his last name is something like robitussin it's Rob it, robito robito there it yeah, is it's, it's never it's said in the movie French Louisiana, Daniel Robito, but it's not sent. No, I was just letting you know, huh. uh, just because it's interesting. I looked dude. it up and then I forgot it again. Sure, sure. Um, but um, so, like Nina mentioned uh, some, earlier, something that I had been thinking about as well, which is to you know to try and compare Candyman to another slasher killer character. His closest analog is Freddy Krueger because they were both uh, you know lynched by. Uh, by a group of angry people one way or another for differing reasons, of course. But then uh, mm. it was through that that they were both able to live on in the collective unconscious and their existence is fueled entirely by the belief and the fear of, uh, Freddie calls them his children, uh, Candyman calls them his congregation. And I think it's really interesting that the the two of them they're like you know their hand quirk that they have Candyman's was forced onto him but freddy chose his mm -hmm. and yeah i no. don't i don't know i just i i don't really think this comparison goes anywhere i just think it's interesting i, yeah, think I don't it, think it, it goes anywhere but i think it's neat i think it is like really interesting both... because yeah freddy is um a victim of a mob, but Freddy actually did something wrong. Yeah, um, Freddy deserved and, it and Candyman didn't, but Freddy gets to keep his name and Candyman has to live on being identified only by the way that he was killed for the rest of eternity. And I, yeah. I, I just, I feel like that's just, I feel like it may be something, but it's probably not. I don't know. That's <laughs> it's also interesting at like, the very least. Like Freddy's quippy and Candyman's not quippy, but he does always have something prepared to say like he's more like you know flowing and poetic than quippy but i don't mm. know it just it feels like there's a lot of parallels and Candyman just makes me care so much more than freddy does though <laughs> he does it's really hard freddy's just easy to ignore let's be real here yeah he's not like he's annoying <laughs> he's just he's an, an annoying asshole man. <laughs> um um, yeah, yeah, I think that's all I've got on that point, though. Like, I didn't, I didn't have anywhere to go with that. I just thought the parallels were interesting. I have one more thing to say on Candyman and what I mentioned earlier about um, him being a representation of stereotypes and how they're perpetuated is that he's 
as a representation of stereotypes, he's also a representation of how stereotypes are untrue because um, mm. as a character, he rejects every black stereotype for the most part. Yeah. Um, so that's also really important, like as a representation of a dangerous um, of a dangerous black man. He fits none of the stereotypes that are usually a part of that. And I think that's important. I don't think the story would work well if he if he wasn't exactly who he is, because I think it would become more of a um I think it would become more of of a spectator thing than it than it would a commentary. Even though yeah. it still is, and that's like the biggest problem with it. But like, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, right, right. The stuff that I've already said. But I did I did want to bring that up because it is something that's that I've been thinking about. Uh anything else from anyone? Emma? No. Um, <laughs> Jeff, you got a theme song for Noah's Notes? I do. Whoa, you missed out here last she time. Comes. So. Watch out, Noah. She'll read your notes. Whoa, here she comes. <laughs> She's a note reader. Nah, All reader. Notes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. Beautiful. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, Beautiful. Incredible. Iconic. I, I before we get into the notes, I just saw Noah's note that says '90s Cup Gang" out here. I think he's talking about the windbreakers that some. Of I the am people talking about the windbreakers. <laughs> yes. Yes. Green. I yes. hate those windbreakers. As a kid, my mom had one that was teal and purple, as a lot of them were that she would make me wear. I hated that thing. I think I had the same. Oh one. my god! Yeah, well, they were all teal and purple. Is they, they <laughs> with were. a little That's pink or yellow thrown in? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did a lot of um. I drew a character wearing one a while ago. I've I've adapted it to be more modern, but um, when I was right, initially looking into the windbreakers, um, you got to try and make it. Oh look my good. gosh, they're all so terrible. They it's are. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I oh, I worked with somebody who, in like that? 2018, still wore a windbreaker. She like swore by them. She said like you know, lots of times you don't actually need a jacket. You just need something to keep the wind from chilling you. I can agree, but it was, there's it was a way just to black. do it tastefully. It was a black just black is how to go. So it was like it looked like a jacket. I can agree that windbreakers are a good idea, but the colorful ones are where you lose me. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, the first note's just true. It's I forgot how over the top an Eldritch Candyman was originally built up as, like so dramatic, but also over the top with all the flesh comments. That's just like, Clive Barker. He- I was going to say, Candyman at the beginning of this movie belongs in uh, the Pinhead Brigade. Candyman as a character and Pinhead as a character. I think it's interesting that the characters that, and I kind of relate to this as a writer, honestly, and and an artist, the characters that are the coolest and the most interesting are also the ones that sound the most that just like Clive Barker's writing style. He allows them to be so poetic and over the top like he is in his descriptions. And I just relate to that. (laughs) I think it's interesting to be like, yeah, all of the other characters I have to really focus on and, and make sure that they sound at least a little realistic. But with my villain, oh boy, I get to do whatever the heck I want. (laughs) Um, we got strip naked on the couch, as you do. Yep. Oh, yeah. As as biker man comes over and she's like on the couch and she's like, oh, and strips naked as he walks in. <laughs> she was Gotta ready make to sure go. he knows what's happening. Um, We have her husband decided the best lie was to just admit then admit it then gaslight, which is exactly <laughs> what Trevor does. Uh. <laughs> We just got a lot of bitching about Trevor here. <laughs> uh, that makes sense. Um, I don't remember what Trevor's lecture was about. That's a fun fact. It's not about Candyman. It's about something else. It's about but urban I legends do not in remember. general. Yeah, but doesn't he mention? He opened a up talking urban about legend? like crocodiles in the sewer, and then he oh, moves crocodiles to, in the sewer. Uh, That's what it was. Then he moves to something else. Um. We have Helen getting labeled as a cop does not make you safe her. No. <laughs> uh, a whole ass person died here, Helen. Please be a little less weird. The fact that their names are Helen and Trevor makes bitching them out as as like an audience way more fun. It just feels <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> could only be better if her name was Karen. Honestly, mm, Helen yeah. is just she, just she a, is a little bit of a Karen. A little bit. Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're just causing problems. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. Well, Helen, maybe stop causing problems. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it's not that much to ask. Um, Noah noted, I love the stark contrast of the hallway and Anne-Marie's apartment. That's just really good set design right there. Mm -hmm. um, you go a inside lot of the set and it's all like movie. clean paint and it's really homey. Mm -hmm. Still cinder block, but, you know, clean paint and homey. But then the hallway is just drowning in graffiti. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's an, an a really, really good set cool. design. Um, I think it speaks to that Anne Marie is not where she lives and projecting onto her the fact that she lives in this place and judging her based on where she lives um, shouldn't mean anything. Yeah. I think that kind of the, the apartment itself is really good set design because it plays into that. It's kind of a callback uh, yeah. to the classist themes that are in the book. Mm -hmm. Sort of like being in low-income yeah. housing does not make you a, a, a scuzzy person by any means. It just means you don't no, have money. No, you are not. Yeah, you are. She's like, I think that movie, It the movie does a really good job of that without like say, like saying it outright. Yeah. Uh, we have, I love how they managed to get Ben Franklin in this movie. <laughs> he couldn't have been cheap. Right. Um... <laughs> we just have chunky shit. <laughs> it is. The writing on the bathroom walls okay. is so chunky. Okay, so here's here's my <laughs> opinion on, on the bathroom scene. I've been in bathrooms that have had shit smeared on the wall. It does not look like that. That <laughs> it doesn't it has yeah. never looked like that to me. That was just melted Nestle Crunch. Oh that, yeah. <laughs> I don't really even know if it was melted. It. It's almost solid. <laughs> well, melted and then it gets hard again. Ooh, I'm not gonna lie. A crunch bar does sound really good right now. How can you even say that? Why would you say that? Nothing to do with the bathroom stuff. They're Just, not I haven't even thought good. about a Nestle Crunch in a long time. And you Nestle know. Crunch is good. They're not. Well, I don't like the bars as much, but like bunch of crunch. That's where that shit's at. Um, Welcome to the Candyman episode. Know. Candyman might not have candy Finally, in it. Finally, somebody this talking sure about does. We're <laughs> gonna talk about candy. <laughs> um, I'm a hard candy guy myself. I love I know the notes about the doctor's scene. I love how he has four tiny TVs that just show the same thing. They don't yeah, even show the different angles. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he just turns them all off, and he's like, "That was you," and it's like. It, it wasn't until he turned well, he them just, off that I registered that that was four TVs showing the same thing. Yeah, and it's like he turns them on and it's just queued up to the exact moment on the tape where she's like, he must have had that set up ahead of time. Oh, without a doubt. Like, oh, you know what I'm going to have uh, to he do? He was ready to show the, the tape of her tied to this bed. <laughs> um... We have... I love how on the... How this looks like it, to an outsider um, when she's like, saying that Candyman did it. It looks like she just got way too into local folklore. <laughs> so that's that, that's a good one. That's an interesting one. I think that plays into what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we have some commentary on Candyman's design. Um, some of the details, like Noah says, I do love his coat. I also really like how the hook hand always is wet. Yeah. It's always wet. It is. Um, and we just have, the way that I, like the the fur around that cuff is all full of blood, like right? I, I just thought that was oh a my good god, touch. I like it a lot. Um, so not to shill myself or anything, but I did a, a minimalist design for Candyman for a poster. It's up on our wall over um, next to me, um, and I have been glancing at it every now and again just because I like how it looks. But that's one thing that I put extra attention into when I was doing the hook part is that there is like blood like dried and also still wet like clumping on the sleeve. It looks so good. Mm -hmm. um, it's It adds to the feel. It adds to making it feel more like realistic and it looks really good. Um, we have a conversation here that actually happened where I said does Helen count as a final girl? And Noah said, no, she dies. And I said, oh yeah, I was so excited about her killing Trevor that I forgot how she's able to do it. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, and then Helen kills Trevor and he deserves it, but I forgot that she does it as a ghost. Uh, so rip me. Um, 
We have Candyman after getting stabbed is just happy that Helen came to visit. He really shakes <laughs> that off like it's nothing. <laughs> He is a ghost. <laughs> he is a ghost. He is a ghost. He, I don't know why she thought that would work, but she just he just sits up and he's like, oh, hi. You came here to kiss me. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some bee kisses. Noah says, memory serves. Helen's actress was super allergic to bees. One of them was at least. Also, Tony didn't get stung too much over the mo- course of the movie, if I'm recalling things. He did, he did. though. <laughs> In fair, 20 times over the course of I all those bee scenes with bees in number. his mouth. There's only one scene where he's got the bees in his mouth. I don't know. How many times do they have to shoot that, though? A lot. That man's just like... He's just sitting there with bees in his mouth. I guess the way that they do that is they get him cold first. Tony Todd got stung 23 times, so that's an extra $23,000 he earned from that scene. Candyman. Tony Todd made more money getting stung by bees in a movie than I make in a year. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he deserved it because holy cow he did but man um i don't know if the bees in this movie if the bee stuff in this movie counts as animal cruelty i do think about that a lot no they they talked about it a lot they had um apiaries on scene um the bees did not live long they super super quick life um mm-hmm. yeah well that is i guess they bred like an entire new like kind of bee for the movie so they would uh, like develop their stingers later than other bees, so uh, so they could like look like adults but not have fully developed stingers. So when they stung, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Did they develop the bees for the movie, or did they just find bees that were they like developed that it for specifically the for the movie? It That's only took so like wild. six months to selectively That's breed fair. bees I guess to that point. Bees do be doing because as yeah, as Noah said, they they don't live that long. So a generation of bees like is like there and gone for them. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having that information on hand because that's something I was curious about. They stole it from uh, another podcast. <laughs> Don't tell them <laughs> <too. lovely. laughs> Uh We have you hear that Steve, Ben, Jeff's stealing from you. <laughs> I know you listen. <laughs> I wish that. Uh, we have. I can take both of them. <laughs> take Ben. He's a frail little guitar man. I'm a, anyway, uh, I'm a much stronger guitar man. <laughs> you literally are. Uh, we have um, Candyman just needs to learn to seduce people better. Uh, he, Helen would have stayed if he held up his end of the deal. I think that that wasn't the he, problem, but <laughs> that that was he was holding up his end of the deal though. His his plan though he he says so doesn't he? His plan was for all three of them to die in the fire and thereby. The no, both he said she to her and th- the baby become ghosts and live with him. He said in a couple times that if she came with him, he would make sure the baby was unharmed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he yeah. did okay. specify that the baby would be fine just as long as she did everything he wanted. And she showed up and was like, all right, candy boy, let's go. And then he gave her the bee smooch and then. He put the baby the in the burn pile. Mouth of bee smooch. It open was mouth bee smooch. Um, the last note that I will read is, "Man, the Candyman theme slaps." It does it's so much better than I remember. The soundtrack it of this movie is so good. It and is. So I'm gonna uh, circumvent Nina's final note. I'm gonna read the second to final note, which is just pointing out that Trevor's mistress is bouncing the blade of the knife on her hand, like, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, why was she doing um, that? Waiting for him. And that was the sharp half of the knife. And then it shows her angrily slicing steak for whatever steak and vegetable dish she's, she's making him. Yeah, and then she, like, cuts but, herself. Yeah. But not when she was going... Yeah, what, what was the deal with that? Why would she do that? Is that just to yeah. show us that she doesn't know what she's doing with a knife? Or? I think yes. so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not like Helen, who cooked food before Trevor even got home. So that After when she he got, got home, he had a hot meal dealer. on the table. <sighs> exactly. <sighs> Poor Helen. But also Helen sucks. Anyway, that's the synopsis of the whole movie. Uh, is poor we Helen, but also Helen sucks. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> candy man. Um, we candy the Mandy. We candy the Mandy. Uh, and mm-hmm. the new one again. <laughs> Please go see it. We're not going to be discussing it here on the podcast yet. Maybe we we will one day. I was going to say, I thought we were. Are we going to? I thought, I thought we can talk about this later. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, but we like maybe not right when we watch it though is is definitely the thing. Um, but we'll talk about this later. <laughs> we'll talk. Okay, sorry. Um, but we will be watching it, and you should too. And if you want to discuss it with us, um, right when you watch it, you can join our Discord. Hey yeah. yeah. <laughs> Discord. Um, Discord. Yeah, that there's a link to that on our Twitter. Uh we share horror memes and talk about horror stuff and it's super fun. So definitely and, do and that. Pictures of mice. And pictures yeah, of and mice, which is I think my favorite part of the Discord server. Um Yep. True. There's the theme of the Discord server, and then there's the purpose of the Discord server. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly uh but yeah this is to wrap up um thank you guys for listening next time i don't actually know what we'll be i believe it's about. emma <laughs> oh no oh, I it is my turn next i have been waiting so, so long <laughs> next time we are watching gonjiam haunted asylum uh, it excited. is on amazon prime uh, it's a movie I watched, and it's literally the scariest movie I've seen. Uh, and I'm real excited for to force everybody else to watch it. I've been looking um, forward to this one. Please watch it with the lights off and headphones on, preferably. What should so I be excited. listening to? The movie. Oh, <laughs> uh, Mudvayne's title <laughs> album. Uh, oh but it is a. <laughs> It is a found footage horror movie, kind of. Um, Ooh, I don't know. And it's, it kind of propels the genre in a couple of ways that I really, really enjoyed, uh, and I'm excited to talk about. I um, bet it's going to be the best found footage movie I've ever seen. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, but yeah, so it is a Korean horror film, and I think it's very, very well done. Uh, trigger warnings, um, possession, mm -hmm. scariness. Um, I think there's some nudity, but other than that, is there I a dong or anything? Um, there may be a dong. Oh. We're not gonna make any PPs this time. Um, <laughs> don't watch this yeah, one with so, your mom. But, Personal predictions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm real. I'm really looking forward to it. So. Go I'm watch so it. But um, as always, I'm Emma. You can find me on Twitter at Emma Panada or on Twitch at Emma Panada, where I stream PTRPG stuff. And I'm Nina. You can find me at Nina Wolverina uh, on Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. You can also find me at House Usher Rises. I retweet horror art and sometimes talk about horror movies there. You can also. Sometimes find me on Emma's uh, Twitch channel. <gasps> I play uh, in a game some Sundays. It's super bikes on brooms. Bikes on broom. I'm super excited about it. Uh, no, I will not explain that. Uh, and yeah, I don't think you have to explain that you're excited about it. No, about the bikes on broom. <laughs> uh, you're so funny. Oh my god. No, you can find me as Bubba the Bad. B u b b a d a b a d. Twitch, Twitter, and Insta. Uh, you know, I always have, I'm preloaded for that part. And I have nothing to say for the rest of it. Like on off the air, I'm like, this is the game I might be playing tonight. And then over here, it's just like, there's nothing horror specific I do <laughs> um, yeah, on that's fine. most of my stuff. But I am going to talk about watching movies. Heck yeah. I mean, if it makes you feel any better, least. I always feel weird about the fact that I don't stream and all of you do. Yeah, I've so, stream for a long time. You could More start streaming. Development. I I would. I have nothing to stream. Stream your uh, stream your powerlifting. That would be yeah. very boring to watch. You just be like, <laughs> all right, guys, rat. this is gonna be a pog lift. <laughs> <laughs> and then I pass out on a bench press like I did in the competition, and then exactly, <laughs> it's just nothing because I never have a spotter. So if I pass out in the garage, I would literally just die. <laughs> Well, the well, chat Jeff, would go wild. Well, but in any case, die. in case any of that does happen, you can hear about it on my Twitter at Bubba Wubba Dab. B U B B A W U B B A D A B A B B B A D A B B A D B B B. Uh, and you can find me on yep. Instagram and TikTok at the Hammer of Jeff. Love it. And you can follow um, the and... the podcast Twitter at what Casual Horror Pod. 
Yes, yeah. that is correct. <laughs> At Casual Horror Pod. Um, thank you all for listening to this very long episode. But we will talk to you next time. Stay spooky.